My name is Scott Harris. I'm Executive Director of Museums for the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this program put on by one of our institutions, the James Monroe Museum. We will be doing this program tonight as a webinar and also on Facebook Live, and we encourage those viewing to uh, post comments during the program with the chat or Q&A functions or posting them um, uh, through Facebook, and they will be routed to our fearless public programs coordinator, Lindsay Crawford, who will then um, process those to pass on to our speaker. Uh, we want to thank the Friends of the James Monroe Museum uh, for the support of this and all of the public programming that we do. And we do invite you uh, to look at upcoming events that will be happening uh, at the museum, including Deck the Halls and our Holiday Open House, both programs live again for the first time in a while. And you can go either to the museum's Facebook page or you can go to our website, James Monroe Museum. Let me try that again. James Monroe Museum.umw.edu. So we do invite you to uh, check those things out. Um, we also uh, do hope that as you post questions that you will keep them on topic and as uh, succinct as possible. So we'll have maximum time for uh, answering as many as we can get to in the time that we have. James Monroe was inaugurated as the fifth president of the United States on March 4th, 1817. Washington, D.C. still bore the scars from the British uh, uh, Army's destructive visit three years earlier during the War of 1812. Monroe took the oath of office uh, outside of the temporary Capitol building as the legislative chamber was being rebuilt. And after the ceremony, the president and first lady Elizabeth Monroe could not receive guests at the White House, nor could they move in. And even if it had been habitable uh, and not a construction zone, there were no furnishings uh, anywhere within the building that were suitable for use. There were no draperies on the windows, no clocks on the mantles, and no chairs upon which to sit. Solving the problem of furnishing the president's house was one of the top priorities for President Monroe. Choices that he made to acquire what he called articles of the best kind helped define a sense of White House style that subsequent uh, administrations sought to emulate. We are very fortunate this evening to hear from someone uniquely qualified to describe and to assess James Monroe's role in refurnishing the White House and the contemporary efforts to conserve and interpret the items that he carried. Melissa Nolan is the Associate Curator of Decorative Arts for the White House, uh, where she has served since 2003. Prior to coming to the White House, she held previous curatorial positions at George Washington's Mount Vernon, the Winneter Museum in Winneter, Delaware, and the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. She holds a Master of Arts degree from the Winneter Program in Early American Culture at the University of Delaware and a Bachelor of Arts from Smith College. She writes and lectures frequently on White House topics. And so we are very pleased and I am pleased to welcome for the 35th James Monroe Lecture, live from the White House, Melissa Nolan. Thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate it. And I'm uh, very happy to be here tonight. Um, welcome to the 35th annual um, James Monroe Lecture. Um, I just wanted to um, thank uh, Scott Harris, Lindsey Crawford, and um, Jared Carney for the invitation and for the assistance in preparing for the invitation. Um, I should just note two things before I begin. Um, one is that unless otherwise indicated on the slide, all the images are from our collection, the White House collection. And um, two is that I sincerely regret not taking French in high school and please forgive any mispronunciations. Um, so let's, uh, let's delve in. Um, the story of the French furnishings in the home of the American presidents begins with the largest disaster in the history of Washington, D.C., the burning of the federal city in August 1814 by British troops during the War of 1812. And Lindsay, if I can have the first slide. After destroying the Capitol building, the British continued west down Pennsylvania Avenue to the president's house, setting it ablaze via lighted torches thrown through broken out windows. When First Lady Dolly Madison fled the house just a few hours earlier, she had directed the removal of a few items of particular value, including the residence's only painting, 
the full-length portrait of George Washington by Gilbert Stuart, as well as the red velvet curtains in the central oval parlor. With the exception of those few saved items, the house's interior was a complete loss, with only the exterior stone walls left standing, as this 1814 drawing in our collection illustrates. Next slide, please. Rebuilding the President's House began under James Madison's tenure, but refurbishing the interior would fall to his successor, fellow Virginian James Monroe. The house was still uninhabitable when Monroe was inaugurated in March 1817, and he let it be known that completing it was a priority. While the bricklayers, carpenters, plasterers, and painters were hard at work, Monroe began to plan for furnishing the interiors. Just a month after his inauguration, Monroe wrote to two American agents based in La Havre, France, Joseph Russell and John Lafarge, to place an order for a large quantity of French goods for the rebuilt house. Next slide, please. Monroe's high regard for French furnishings was born out of his intimate familiarity with them. His first extensive exposure to French-made goods was probably at Monticello, the home of his good friend Thomas Jefferson. When Jefferson returned from his post as American minister to France in 1789, he shipped home 86 cases of French goods. At roughly the same time Jefferson was returning from France, Monroe first moved to Charlottesville. In 1793, Monroe would become Jefferson's immediate neighbor by purchasing a 1,000-acre farm adjacent to Monticello, which he named Highland. At Monticello, Monroe would have sat in Louis XVI furniture in the parlor, ate off of French porcelain and silver, silver tableware, and noted the time on French clocks. Next slide, please. In 1794, Monroe, his wife Elizabeth, and their five-year-old daughter Eliza relocated to Paris after James was appointed to Jefferson's former job, Minister to France. On your left, do you see a miniature of James Monroe painted circa 1796 by Louis Sene while Monroe was serving in France? On the right is a portrait of the Monroe's daughter Eliza, which is also thought to have been completed in France during this period. The Monroe family thrived in France, thoroughly embracing the culture and becoming popular hosts. Next slide, please. After living for six months in the same house that Monroe's predecessor, Governor Morris had rented, Monroe decided to purchase property, selecting a landmark estate at the edge of Paris called the Folie de Boucherie. Next slide. Built in the 1750s and modified in the 1760s, the house was an Italian style villa finished with an extravagant, in an extravagant style typical of the reign of Louis XV with marble mosaic floors, Italian mantles, and elaborate paneled woodwork. Next slide. The Monroes furnished their new home with modern French mahogany furniture, typical of the restrained directoire period that followed the French Revolution, when gilded furniture's strong association with the former monarchs caused it to fall out of favor. Next slide. Oh, sorry, I think I'm one off. Let me go back to the French furniture. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary Pinckney, wife of Monroe's successor as minister, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, took note of the Monroe's furnishings when she visited the Folie shortly before the Monroe's departed. Quote, Mr. Monroe's furniture is handsome, but as he ordered it with a view to take it to America, the chairs are not gilt and do not suit the rooms. End quote. In the slide here, you see three surviving pieces from the mahogany suite that the Monroes purchased for their French home. From left to right is a tea table, a commode, and a dessert console. All are in the collection of the James Monroe Museum and Memorial Library. I think the question of whether the Monroes' furnishing choices were driven by the current fashion when they arrived or were truly influenced by their understanding of how the furniture would be perceived back home is debatable. Monroe was recalled as minister to France in 1796 and returned to the United States in 1797. He was widely accused of being too sympathetic to the French Republic in light of the widespread violence and upheaval there in the 1790s 
and he clashed politically with Federalists, such as George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. After his good friend and political ally Thomas Jefferson assumed the United States presidency, Monroe was selected to return to Europe in 1803, serving in a number of different ambassadorial roles, including as a member of the American team that negotiated the Louisiana Purchase. The Monroes, now with second daughter Mariah also in tow, happily returned to Paris, where Eliza re-enrolled in the prestigious French school she had attended previously. While in Paris, for the second posting, James and Elizabeth Monroe also attended the coronation of Napoleon Bonaparte. Next slide, please. This is an image of the velvet dress that Elizabeth Monroe is believed to have worn to that coronation, along with a set of citrine jewelry, which she may have paired with it. Returning permanently to the United States in late 1807, the Monroes would remain lifelong Francophiles, even continuing to use French as their primary language at home. Next slide, please. These are the portraits of President and Mrs. Monroe that hang at the White House. Note especially the turban and ermine, stool, ermine stole worn by Mrs. Monroe, who continued to follow French fashions after her return to the United States. When James Monroe contacted Russell and Lafarge about securing French furnishings for the president's house in 1817, he drew on his firsthand experience to dictate exactly what he wanted and how much he was willing to pay for each item. Congress had appropriated $20,000 to furnish the house, and Monroe budgeted 12000 of that for the French goods, although he also allowed an overage of up to $3,000, thereby committing a full 75% of his budget to imported French items. He did not seek French-made furnishings for all rooms in the house, but ordered strategically, focusing on the spaces where formal entertaining would be centered. Most of the French goods were intended for the state dining room and the central oval-shaped parlor at the center of the state floor. I should note here that while Elizabeth Monroe also undoubtedly provided input on the French orders, unfortunately, there is little surviving evidence of her involvement. With the exception of the window hangings in the oval parlor, the most expensive French goods procured by Monroe formed the literal centerpiece of the state dining room in the form of a surtout de table or, or plateau. Next slide, please. The Monroe Plateau, as it has come to be called in the White House, consists of seven sections of horizontal mirror glass surfaces surrounded by balustrades of the finest cast in gilded bronze. When all seven sections are in use, the plateau stretches out over 14 feet in length. The plateau's 16 plinths hold either small urns or graceful classical female figures whose outstretched arms support a candle on each side. In addition, the plateau ensemble included seven containers that could be used to hold decorations such as fruit or flowers. Next slide. This image shows the three different forms of these containers. There are three baskets, like the one shown on the left, in two different sizes, and two each of the other pieces. Russell and Lafarge specifically commented on the plateau in their correspondence with Monroe after shipping. Quote, the surtout is very handsome. It has been made by the best manufacturer in Paris, who lost by it near 2,000 francs. End quote. The plateau clearly accomplished its intent to impress, as almost every known written account of dining in the president's house in the years after it was introduced mentions it. After having dinner at the White House in February 1818, New York Congressman Thomas Hill Hubbard wrote to his wife that, quote, the plateau was the most elegant thing that I ever saw, end quote. Next slide, please. Monroe also secured from Paris beautifully crafted silver and porcelain tablewares for the president's house. The White House retains both of the most elaborate pieces Monroe ordered, a pair of soup tureens made by Jacques-Henri Fauconnier, a Parisian silversmith frequently patronized by Napoleon. Note the customization on the lids of these tureens, each of which features an American eagle finial. Russell and Lafarge also provided three dozen gilded silver fruit knives, these made by J.B. Boyton. Nineteen of these knives survive in the collection. 
Note the small shields on the mother of pearl handles that are engraved with an American eagle and the traditional inscription, President's House, on the blades. Next slide, please. Two French porcelain services were provided by Russell and Lafarge, one for dinner and one for dessert. Each service was for 30 people. The description of the dinner service and the French receipts is uncharacteristically vague, describing it only as a, quote, gilt porcelain dinner service, end quote. Next slide. But the dessert service was specifically described as having, quote, an amaranth border with five vignettes representing strength, agriculture, commerce, the arts, the science, sciences, and the coat of arms of the United States in the center of the plate. Amaranth refers to the distinctive reddish purple color of the border of this service. And this service was made by the partnership of Pierre-Louis Dagaty and Edouard Honoré. Next slide. A pair of French porcelain vases were acquired for each of the three rooms we now know as the color parlors, the green, blue, and red rooms. The pair originally purchased for what is now the green room seems to have been selected for its special connection to the United States and possibly to Monroe himself. The vases featured hand-painted scenes of the Passy neighborhood of Paris. One shows the house that Benjamin Franklin lived in when he was serving as American minister to France, and the other shows the view from Franklin's residence. This is the pair that you see on the left-hand side. Only one vase of the pair purchased for the current blue room survives and features an unidentified landscape scene. The pair on the right were purchased for the current red room and feature images of the Greek poet Homer at left and the Byzantine general Belisarius on the right in the image on the right. Next slide, please. Two French mantel clocks arrived in the shipment from Russell and Lafarge. The larger, more expensive clock on the left was for the oval parlor or blue room, while the smaller clock was for the adjacent parlor to the west, the current red room. The oval parlor clock featured a figure of Minerva, the Roman goddess of wisdom, war, and the arts. This clock highlights Minerva's traditional connection to strategic warfare, as the base is decorated with military accoutrements of shields, helmets, and weapons. The case was made by the foremost bronzier working in Paris at the time, Pierre-Philippe Tomir, while the clocks were made by Louis Monet Sr. The clock for the Red Room cost less than half as much as the Minerva clock, and it too had a war theme, depicting Hannibal, the most famous general, from the northern African region of Carthage. The mounts on the clock feature the names of some of Hannibal's most noteworthy victories, including the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC during the Second Punic War. Hannibal is shown displaying the golden rings he reportedly confiscated from slain Roman noblemen after his army's victory in Italy. Why did Russell and Lafarge choose these two particular clocks for the American president's house? It seems that the answer is that the figures depicted on the clocks were fully clothed. As they explained to Monroe in a letter, quote, we had great difficulty in getting pondules or clocks without nudities and were in fact forced to take the two models we have bought on that account. Quote. Next slide, please. The French were particularly well known for their gilded bronze or bronze doré products during the empire period, and Monroe proved an avid consumer of these luxury goods for the president's house. In addition to the spectacular plateau ensemble and mantel clocks already discussed, a large number of gilded bronze lighting fixtures were included in Russell and Lafarge's shipment. Each of the three parlors received a gilt bronze and crystal chandelier. The rooms now known as the red and the green room each received a 30 light chandelier, while the center oval room the current blue room received a 50 light chandelier. Monroe was charged 2,800 francs for the largest one, although Russell and Lafarge noted that, quote, the crystal and gilt bronze lustre or chandelier is of superior workmanship and has originally been ordered by the French government, and if it was to be made again, would cost 5,000 francs. 
This chandelier was commonly referred to as Napoleon's chandelier within the White House. Sadly, none of these chandeliers survive, nor any of the sconces or lamps purchased for the president's house by Monroe. Only four of the 1817 French lighting fixtures are extant, two pairs of superb candelabra, one of each pair that you see on the screen. Following the same pattern as seen with the chandeliers, the largest and most expensive pair of candelabra were purchased for the Oval Room, while a similar but smaller pair were purchased for the other two parlors. We are fortunate to have the Oval Room pair, as well as the pair originally purchased for the Red Room. We can thank the detailed bill of lading used to ship the French items for knowing exactly which pair was intended for which space. The pair for the Oval Room was described as, quote, one pair candelabra, figure of a woman in antique colored bronze, holding above her head a group of six lights with ornaments, the figures mounted on square bases with military trophies, the branches and bases gilded matte, end quote. You will see that the pair on the left fit that description with the exception of finish. The original antique bronze finish on the figures was replaced with gilding at an unknown period. The description for the candelabra for the sitting room or parlor, the current red room, was less precise, identified as, quote, one pair of candelabra with figures on square matte gilt pedestals for six lights, but was still distinct from the ones for the card room, the current green room, which were each on a round base. Principles of hierarchy in finishing a grand home are clearly evident here, as you can see the differences in size and finish detail to these two pairs of candelabra intended for spaces of differing formality and importance. As fortunate as we are to have so many surviving pieces from Monroe's important order, the existence of detailed receipts also tease us with the descriptions of all the things that we do not believe have survived. In addition to the missing lighting fixtures just mentioned, we also have no knowledge of the piano, multiple looking glasses, fireplace equipment, mahogany pier tables, gilded cornices, and textiles that Russell and Lafarge supplied. From written descriptions only, we know that the piano was made by Arar Frere and featured bronze columns. The fireplace equipment for the red room featured eagles, while the set for the green room featured lions. And the chandelier in the red room had ornaments of women and a bust of Diana, branches with the head of Minerva. Possibly most tantalizing in the description of the is the window hangings for the oval room, which at almost 10,000 francs were the most expensive items supplied. We know that the curtains were made of, quote, delicate crimson with a six inch border, and that the curtain rods consisted of, quote, an arch and an eagle holding an olive branch and a sheaf of arrows in his claws, the whole gilded. Quote. Next slide, please. The question of what survives and what doesn't and what we can learn about missing French furnishings from documentary evidence are all at the heart of a project that I have been engaged in most of my 19 years at the White House, regilding and reupholstering the French furniture suite in the Blue Room to more accurately reflect what it would have looked like when it was new. I have left the discussion of this suite, arguably the most famous of the items sent by Russell and Lafarge, for last so that I can delve into it with more detail. The suite originally consisted of 53 pieces made by Pierre Antoine Bellinger, whom Russell and Lafarge described to Monroe as, quote, the first or best ebeniste in Paris. Furniture historians probably would not refer to him that way now, although he was well respected in his time. By 1817, Bellinger had been working as a master craftsman for almost 30 years. He had successfully navigated the many political upheavals in France during his career and had made furniture for King Louis XVI, Napoleon, and King Louis XVII. The latter king appointed him an official craftsman to the restored monarchy. In the same year, Bellinger completed the commission for the president's house. Bellinger was also experienced in supplying furniture for official residences, having furnished the royal courts in Sweden, Denmark, and the Netherlands. Although Monroe had indicated his desire for mahogany furniture when placing his order, 
he received a gilded wood suite instead. Writing to Monroe at the time of shipment, Russell and Lafarge explained that while they had tried their best to adhere to his requests and budget constraints, they had vastly overspent Monroe's stated budget for, quote, one of the most important commissions, the furniture for the large oval room, which is caused by the change which we have been obliged to make of gilt wood instead of mahogany. The result of that substitution has been an increase of expense for the trimmings of the fauteuil, etc., and the draperies of the curtains, which must be richer, that everything might be in harmony. We should also add that mahogany is not generally admitted in the furniture of a saloon, even at private gentlemen's houses. End quote. Russell and Lafarge justified their choices by asserting that they chose, quote, articles as united strengths with elegance of form, and combining at the same time simplicity of ornament with the richness suitable to the decoration of a house occupied by the first magistrate of a free nation, end quote. These words probably echo sentiments expressed by Monroe when he placed the order, a communication which unfortunately has not survived. Russell and Lafarge's letter speaks to the changes that had occurred in French fashions in the decades since Monroe had last been there. Monroe's request for mahogany furniture probably seemed outdated to the French agents and cabinet maker, reflecting his familiarity with fashions in the late 1790s and early 1800s, but displaying ignorance of the recent empire-style fashions. Russell and Lafarge, knowing that Monroe desired to furnish the American president's house in a manner that would help establish the new nation's credibility on the world stage, were confident enough to overrule him and possibly felt that they were saving the president from embarrassment. Next slide, please. Monroe's reaction to the furniture substitution is unknown. Regardless of his feelings, he probably knew he had little choice in the matter. He was anxious to reopen the president's house to the public and would have been unable to secure a suite of sufficient quality more to his liking on a short notice. He seems, therefore, to have made the best of the situation. The sheer number of total pieces in the suite, 53, must have overwhelmed the room. It is important to note that there were three fewer doorways in the room than there are today, but two nine-foot sofas, 18 armchairs, 18 side chairs, two large armchairs with enclosed sides, two fire screens, four stools with X-shaped stretchers, six footstools, and a pier table is still a lot of furniture, even for a large room like the Blue Room. Indeed, it does appear that a significant number of the chairs were moved out of the room fairly quickly, as the 1825 furnishings inventory, the first taken after the arrival of the Bell and Jay suite, identifies only 24 of the original 38 chairs remaining in the room. Later inventories confirm that 16 of the Bell and Jay chairs were eventually moved into the green room next door. A visitor to the president's house in 1825 described the positioning of the many chairs, writing that they were, quote, alternately armed and single, so that in the arrangement of the chairs around the room, there appears to be no confusion of arms, but a resplendency and simplicity, which is very admirable, end quote. Next slide, please. The only known period image of the room with the Ballinger furniture in it dates to 1856, just three years before the suite was removed and later auctioned, and gives us an idea of how the furniture was arranged late in its use. Chairs are seen lining the perimeter of the walls as described earlier, but a few are also seen pulled in towards the center of the room. The single pier table is positioned directly across positioned directly opposite the mantel in the room and surmounted by a large mirror. The two sofas flank the pier table on either side and have small footstools arranged in front of them. The two fire screens are placed diagonal to the fireplace with one of the four original curl-based stools in between. The only furniture forms not visible in the scene are the two bergeres or closed side armchairs. We believe the public would have first seen Monroe's new French interiors on New Year's Day, 1818, when the president held an open house. 
as could probably be predicted, reactions varied. What some saw as elegance, others saw as unjustified excess for the head of a Republican government. Someone identifying himself as a journeyman cabinet maker wrote to the Washington Gazette in 1818 to complain that the new French furnishings at the president's house were all about, quote, pomp and parade, extravagance and profligacy, end quote. American painter and inventor Samuel B. Morris articulated this conflict when he observed in 1819 that some of the president's house is, quote, decorated in the most splendid manner. Some think too much so, but I do not. Something of splendor is certainly proper about the chief magistrate for the credit of the nation, end quote. As Virginia Senator John Taylor wrote in 1823, the highest quality furnishings in the president's house were, quote, designed to impress upon foreign ministers a respect for the United States government, which may have a valuable influence upon our foreign relations. Oh. Thus, while European visitors to the president's house tended to judge it modest, they at least did not accuse the Americans of being ignorant of fashion. Englishman William Foe, who visited the president's house in 1820, found it, quote, neither so elegant, superb, nor costly as the seats of our nobility, but he still declared it a good, substantial, pleasant abode. Congress also weighed in on Monroe's purchasing decisions, particularly because he had far exceeded their, their original appropriation. As mentioned previously, Congress committed $20,000 for the purpose of decorating the president's house anew following the fire. With shipping costs, Monroe's French purchases alone consumed almost the entirety of this budget, and he quickly had to ask for additional funding. In making this request, Monroe and the government agents that he had appointed to oversee the expenditures from the so-called furniture fund provided letters of justification. Thus, Monroe's primary purchasing agent, William Lee, wrote to Congress early in 1818 to explain the cost overruns and specifically addressed the foreign purchases. Concerning the furniture ordered from France, which so far exceeded in price the expectation formed of it, I beg leave to observe that, in making up the order, particular care was taken to specify the articles and fix the price of each, according to direction of the president. But Mr. Russell and Lafarge, who were charged, were not able to complete it at those prices, and knowing how necessary it was for him to have the furniture here in the fall, they procured it on the best terms in their power. It must be acknowledged that the articles are of the very first quality and so substantial that some of them will last and be handsome for 20 years or more. I imagine he would be surprised to learn that the vast majority of the suite was used constantly in the Oval Room for the next 42 years, and that some of the pieces were returned to the White House in the 1960s and 70s and have received an additional 50 to 60 years of use. In retrospect, Monroe and Lee's investment in furnishings for the White House in 1817 seemed like a bargain, considering that some have been in use for over two centuries now. That's not to say, however, that French goods, that the French goods proved indestructible. In a public venue like the White House, furnishings live hard lives, subject to consistent use and movement as the interiors are periodically rearranged to meet the public and personal demands of the current president and their family. This wear and tear catches up after a while, and condition issues often motivate room refurbishments. Such was the case in the Blue Room. All pieces of the original Bellinger suite, save the pier table, were removed in 1859 by President James Buchanan to make way for a new, more fashionable Rococo revival suite made in Philadelphia and chosen by his niece, Harriet Lane. A year later, all of the removed Bellinger pieces were auctioned off to raise money to purchase new furnishings for the president's house, as was the custom. The decision to retain the pier table in 1859 led to the eventual return of other pieces in the suite. The pier table continued to be used in the Blue Room until 1902, before moving down into the diplomatic reception room, located immediately below the Blue Room, in the early 20th century. Eventually, it made its way to storage. 
Jacqueline Kennedy's interest in historic White House furnishings upon becoming First Lady in 1961 led to the pier table's discovery in the White House's storage facility. After Mrs. Kennedy inquired about the survival of any old White House furnishings, staff sent the pier table from its off-site location to the White House for her inspection. The table, by then missing its marble top in mirror glass, was placed temporarily in the White House carpenter shop, where Mrs. Kennedy first saw it, thus spawning the popular story that she found it there. Some accounts even say it was being used as a sawhorse, which was definitely not true. On the left, you see the table as Mrs. Kennedy first saw it. She quickly arranged to have it restored by Janssen, a decorating firm based out of Paris and New York. By publicizing her find of the pier table, Mrs. Kennedy attracted the donation of two armchairs and two side chairs from the original suite. She then commissioned reproduction arm and side chairs from the original suite. Excuse me. She then commissioned the reproduction arm and side chairs to supplement the original chair acquisitions and thus allow the Blue Room to be outfitted with the Bell and Jay suite once again. Next slide, please. Here you see her completed room. In the 1970s, two additional original armchairs, one bergere, which is an even larger armchair with enclosed sides, and one of the two sofas were added to the White House collection. Most recently, the White House reacquired one of the two original fire screens from a small Massachusetts auction house in 2012, and our fifth armchair from a Pennsylvania auction house in 2020. Including the pier table, we now own a total of 11 original pieces from the 53-piece suite. Next slide, please. Like the pier table, all of the Bell and Jay pieces that returned to the White House in the 1960s and 70s had their gilding restored. In almost every case, this meant that each piece of the 1817 furniture was sent to a reputable company in New York City who aggressively stripped any surviving finish and regilded the chairs. Certainly not a technique we would use today, but not uncommon for the period. After decades of use, the 1960s and 70s gilding treatments were severely degraded. The gold was completely worn away in many areas, and in some places, even the gesso layer was gone, revealing patches of bare wood. Soon after I arrived in, to the White House in 2003, we hired historic gilding experts William Lewin and Davida Kovner to survey our original Bell and Jay furniture and determine if any pieces retained any evidence of original gilding. Because of the treatment sustained in the 60s and 70s, few did, but Bill Lewin was able to recover some small finish samples from one of our chairs, which showed original gilding. Next slide, please. These samples were mounted in acrylic and studied under a microscope. In the slide on the left, you see the stratigraphy of the five different gilding treatments this particular chair had had during its lifetime. Perhaps most significantly to our efforts, the scientists at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles were able to use these small samples to determine the exact chemical composition of the gold leaf that the original French gilders used on the White House scene, suite, seen in graph form on the right. This allowed our gilding conservators to choose gold leaf for their regilding treatment that matched the original color as closely as possible. Next slide, please. Our conservators employed the same labor-intensive water gilding techniques to restore the Belanger suite as the Parisian gilders would have used when originally creating it in 1817. After determining if there were any areas of original gilding to preserve and isolating those accordingly, our conservators re removed all other existing finishes. This chair on the left, interestingly enough, the first one to be reacquired, had the most original gilding to protect and here you see it in mid-process. Objects determined not to have any original finish to protect were completely stripped, resulting in bare wood frames as the bergere is seen on the right. Next slide, please. Stripping old finishes from the furniture allowed the conservators to start with the same crisply carved surfaces that the original gilders would have had to work with. They then applied thin layers of gesso comprised of traditional rabbit skin glue and whiting or chalk, 
which fills the pores in the wood and provides a hard, smooth surface for gilding when carefully sanded. The gesso is then recut by conservators to be sure the profile of the wood underneath is represented accurately, as seen in the image on the left. Next, thin layers of colored clay called bowl are applied over the gesso so that the gold leaf that will be applied on top of it can be burnished or polished to a highly reflective surface. The color of the bowl applied affects the finished look of the gilded object. Finally, thinly hammered sheets of gold called gold leaf are adhered to the bowl surface. The gold is then polished using different techniques to create contrasting areas of matte and highly burnished or shiny gilding. Next slide. The Bell and J pier table frame is seen here without its top and mirror glass in the four major stages of gilding. Bare wood, covered in gesso on the upper right, covered in bowl, lower left, and finally covered in gold. Next slide, please. Here you see a before and after comparison of the gilding on our pier table. Next slide and on one of our armchairs. The recent gilding is certainly much brighter than we are used to seeing on historic furniture, but we believe the new treatment closely represents the tables and furniture's original appearance based on the information we retrieved through both physical analysis and knowledge of historic French gilding practices. Next slide. Textiles by nature are much less durable than gilding or wood. And we know that the original Bellinger upholstery was replaced by at least 1837, if not before. Our experience using the suite in recent years was that the longest we could typically go before needing to replace the least used textile component on a chair, such as the back panel, was also about 20 years, although the areas that received the most wear, such as the arm pads and the front of the seat rails, might require reupholstery as much as four to five times in that same period. In the early 2010s, the suite had been in its current fabric for over 15 years and was looking very worn, as seen here. Just as we had with the gilding, we embarked on an effort to restore the chair's upholstery as close as possible to its original appearance. We decided early in the process that despite our quest for authenticity, the one detail that we would not be restoring to the original was the color of the fabric. The blue room has been known as such since 1837, when the primary upholstery on the Bellinger suite was changed from red to blue during the administration of Martin Van Buren. We were not going to upend two centuries of tradition by trying to change the blue room to the red room, not to mention we already have one of those. Next slide, please. We did choose to put the armchair that retained the most original gilding into red upholstery, however, after deciding to retire it from regular use in the Blue Room in order to best preserve it. This chair is now displayed at the White House Visitor Center to represent the suite's original colorway. Next slide. We had little physical evidence to go on in recreating the show cover and trims of the Bell and Jay suite. All of our original seating furniture had been completely stripped of any original planned patterned upholstery. The Bell and Jay fire screen, which was acquired in 2012, had a few red threads caught under tacks, which may have been from the original upholstery treatment, and small patches of later blue-colored upholstery, seen here as a detail of the upper left corner of the screen. Next slide. We were more fortunate in regards to the suite's original under upholstery. We were ecstatic to learn that one of the original armchairs from the suite owned since 1919 by our neighbor, the DAR Museum, retained original under upholstery in its back, arm pads, and seat, as seen here. Next slide. The DAR chair also retains layers of solid colored, unpatterned fabric on its back, showing the suite's color change over time. We suspect that the bluish green fabric found on this chair indicates that it was one of the pieces removed out of the oval parlor and into the neighboring green room. Next slide. Our most recent acquisition from the suite, an armchair that came to us in late 2020, also retained its original back under upholstery, seen here, 
and, next slide please, the same red silk backing fabric we had seen on the DAR chair. In an ideal world, we would have found evidence of the original show cover or trims on one of the original pieces from the suite. What we lacked in physical evidence for the original upholstery, though, we more than made up for in documentary evidence. Next slide. The original bill of lading prepared by Russell and Lafarge to accompany the 41 crates of goods they shipped to Monroe is amazingly detailed. Their fastidiousness in accounting and documentation was probably prompted by their need to justify charges which were going to far exceed Monroe's request. This record is an absolute curator's dream, particularly for the Bellinger suite, for which every textile component of each form of furniture is listed individually with quantity and cost information. We therefore know the most minute details about the suite's original upholstery, like how many pounds of horsehair were used to make the mattress for each sofa, 86, and how many L's of 26 linea border was used on each bergere, two. We enlisted the assistance of French historic upholstery expert, Xavier Bonnet, to help us work through this evidence, which we used to determine details, like which width border went where on a piece of furniture, where the different gimps were located, or what type of fabric was used on the armrests. Next, I'm sorry. In comparison, the information we had about the original design of the show upholstery on the Bell and J suite was rather thin. The bill of lading described the fabric as, quote, double warp satin, fine crimson, two-colored gold, and a design of laurel, end quote. The key evidence in the documentary record for our purposes was that the original fabric somehow featured laurel and was of a very fine quality since it had two shades of contrasting gold thread rather than the more typical one shade. Using two shades of the same contrasting color would have given the original fabric greater depth and complexity. We therefore sought a French fabric design appropriate to the Ballinger furniture that was documented to be in use as of 1817. Next slide, please. We settled on an empire medallion pattern in which a wreath of laurel leaves encircles stylized floral designs of a fritillaria flower on the seat back and acanthus leaves and bell flowers on the seat cushion. This fabric pattern with an alternate seat back design was ordered by upholsterer Jean-René Flamand for a suite at Fontainebleau in 1811. The Abeg Stiftung Museum in Switzerland owns the same textile pattern, but in the richer version with two shades of gold instead of one. The Abeg Stiftung example is stamped CF, which is believed to stand for Cartier Ifis, who supplied the original fabric for the White House suite. So that was an important connection for us. The Musée des Tissus in Lyon also owns the pattern seen here, but with the Fritillaria back design instead of the helmet design seen on the seat backs of the Fontainebleau and Abeg Stiftung examples. Next slide. Finally, a suite of furniture marked by Bellinger and very similar in design to the White House suite survived covered in fabric identical in design to the Musée des Tissus example with the Fritillaria back. This suite is now in the collection of Busket Park, a national trust site in Oxfordshire, England. Prell, a textile factory operating in Lyon, France since 1752, reproduced the original fabric on the Busket Park suite in the 1990s, and we asked them to produce the same design for us, but in a custom blue colorway to match the existing draperies and carpet in the blue room. The Claire Passementiers in Paris provided the trims. Next slide, please. The next few slides show a very abbreviated version of the lengthy and time-consuming process of reupholstering just one of the Bellinger armchairs using the same techniques that the original Parisian upholsterers would have used. To minimize damage to the wooden frame that traditional upholstery treatments unfortunately require, we utilize modern alternative upholstery techniques, such as affixing a plywood frame to the top of the seat rails and armrests so that upholstery can be installed onto those rather than into the original wooden frame. Linen webbing is then applied to the seat frame and our historic upholstery expert, Frank Callista, 
begins the tedious process of building up the seat with layers of stitched canvas and horsehair. Next slide, please. The arm pads and seat back are constructed in a similar way, and then all are covered with linen top layers. Frank does all the necessary stitching by hand, as would have been done in 1817. Next slide. These images show Frank and our French consultant, Xavier Bonnet, working out the placement of all the show cover elements and the multitude of trimmings on these chairs, including tapes, cording, and gimp. Next slide. The seat back is also constructed on a modern plywood board, rather than attaching it directly to the chair frame. Here you see the steps of applying show fabric, trims, and backing fabric to the stuffed cake which Frank created from the same linen and horsehair he used for the seat and arm pads. Next slide. I have some before and after images of some of the various Bell and Jay pieces to show you the changes in both gilding and upholstery that we achieved in this project. You will see that in addition to the gilding becoming much brighter, the upholstered form of the seating furniture was changed significantly. The seat back and seat were formed in a more box-like manner with firm edges, as would have been done originally, rather than the more rounded curves of the recent upholstery. The distinct edges were then highlighted with the application of different size decorative tapes, replicating the sizes described in the 1817 receipt. Next slide, please. Even the backs of the refurbished chairs look significantly different as solid colored silk rather than the medallion pattern fabric used previously was applied in accordance with the original receipt. Notice also how the space between the chair rails and the seat back is filled precisely with the decorative tape that defines the edges of the seat. Other corrections in form were also made. Uh, next slide, please. Other corrections form were also made, like constructing a much larger seat pillow for the bergere, as dictated by the documentary records. We have learned a lot since 1995, when the bergere was upholstered without a cushion, as seen at the left. You, um, you see the 95 version there on the left, um, uh, corrected version that occurred around 2000, I believe, and then the, um, the recently redone version on the right. Next slide. The fire screen went through an especially dramatic transformation since it was covered in bronze colored paint when we acquired it. That later finish was removed and the fire screen received the original water gilded finish treatment that it would have had originally. And next slide, please. This shows the backside of the same fire screen. Next slide. My favorite transformation was definitely the original nine foot long sofa, whose back curves to conform to the curved rails of the room. For decades, the sofa had been upholstered within a fixed seat, but the documentary evidence made it clear that the sofa had originally been fitted with a removable seat cushion. The new cushion was recreated exactly as the receipt detailed, down to the 86 pounds of horsehair used for the original. The receipt also revealed that the sofa originally had two smaller cushions, adorned with tassels at the corner, which Frank recreated. Gilding restoration on the pieces would go back, on the pieces that would go back into the blue room began in 2013, and the reproduction fabric and trims arrived in 2017. The dramatic change in appearance between the restored and unrestored chairs made it impossible for us to combine both in the blue room at the same time. So we worked to have enough completed pieces to be able to reinstall the room completely in the updated suite. Next slide. We accomplished this goal in September 2018, debuting the refurbished furniture just slightly more than 200 years after it was first seen in the oval parlor. The fire screen was added to the room at the very end of 2019. The last chairs in the suite to be restored are the reproductions made during the Kennedy administration, and they are currently in the final stages of reupholstery. The last original piece from the suite, the pier table, has been completed by the Gilders within the past month and will be moved back into the house after this holiday season. Next slide. 
Oh, I'm sorry. This we're we're back. Can you back up one, please? When Monroe's purchasing agent. William Lee found himself defending his boss's French purchases to Congress 200 years ago. He wrote, quote, in furnishing a government house, care should be taken to purchase substantial heavy furniture, which should always remain in its place and form as if it were part of the house, such as could be handed down through a succession of presidents suited to the dignity and character of the nation, end quote. Two centuries of time have proven Lee correct as the French furnishings purchased by Monroe have proven undeniably durable, despite heavy use. As such, they are some of the most White House's most valued treasures. That, that outcome was, of course, not obvious in 1818, and one legacy of Monroe's French purchases was an 1826 Act of Congress declaring that, quote, all furniture purchased for the use of the president's house shall be, as far as practicable, of American or domestic manufacture. End quote. That ideal proved unrealistic to achieve in many furnishing categories like porcelain for years. And while future presidents continued to order imported furnishings for the White House, no president since Monroe has furnished the house with the same quantity of foreign goods that he did. Many of Monroe's French purchases, such as the Belanger suite, continue to be used in the White House today, although they are no longer needed to claim legitimacy on the world stage they now represent the significant history of the United States and all that it has achieved to earn that respect. Thank you very much. And Melissa, thank you for that wonderful trip through time and style and, and process that uh, has uh, done so much to not only uh, highlight what James Monroe did in acquiring those pieces, but the, the considerable amount of work that's gone in to, to refurbishing them. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, if he's capable of uh, uh, watching over it from wherever he may be, that he's pleased uh, with the attention so. that's been paid. Um, we will be um, bringing in questions as they arrive, and I will uh, rely on Lindsay to uh, throw a few at us here. I'm, I'm going to lead with one, though, that um, kind of... Uh, some uh, summarizes some of what you were saying throughout that uh, over time with use uh, some of the pieces uh, at different uh, periods of time would be either uh, repaired uh, refurnished or uh, eventually uh, uh, disposed of and today I, we were discussing this off camera that the Belanche suite and other original furniture um, uh, in the White House when guests are there can be sat upon right and then can you can have your, your hors d'oeuvres so. and your wine glass on some of these pieces that what kind of challenge does that present to your staff and in, in dealing with that usage um well it's very much a, a challenge of any museum collection that's in use as yeah. ours is um i mean it's important to us that we um have these objects on display for the American people to, to view and appreciate and use in the case of guests of the president. Um, we certainly practice as many preventive conservation um, methods as we can. Um, we sometimes do remove pieces of that suite um, for certain events. Um, we carefully move and, and store them. We um, have them all fabric protected to resist stains, um, which do happen, um, and treat them, you know, as soon as we can by professional upholstery cleaners. Um, and, uh, you know, they do, we've only had one piece return to the Gilders um, so far. Um, I'm going to need to knock on a lot of wood here, um, just for a chip that it sustained. And so far, we've done pretty good with upholstery, but then we also have had many fewer events in the last few years since the, the suite has debuted. So, um, and other than that, we, I, I, I just pray every day that, you know, I don't come in and, and find out that there was a disaster at last night's reception. Mm -hmm. um, if I can pull it up here and see, uh, we have a question that's come in. Uh, why do you think Jackie Kennedy, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, felt it important to bring out Monroe's furniture specifically? Um, I think, first of all, Jackie, like 
the Monroes was an unabashed Francophile. She loved um, French furnishings. She loved French culture. Um, and so I think the the sweet appealed to her on that level. Um, she actually struggled, I think, in terms of um, the restoration of a lot of the other rooms to not um, constantly lean towards her personal preferences, which were towards French furnishings and not American furnishings. So I think it thrilled her to have the oppor- the legitimate um, opportunity to put French furnishings in um, one of the, the state rooms. Um, it, I think it also appealed to her as the oldest furniture that we know of. Um, of course, the, the furniture that was in the house prior to the, the fire, none of it survives. Um, so the 1817 furnishings from Monroe are really the oldest documented pieces in the house. And so retain, you know, a very special place in, in our, in our history. And I, I assume that all appealed to her. Um, uh, ironically, uh, history repeating itself in a way there with the, uh, the reaction from some quarters about being too French. Um, I have a question I'm going to ask later about pieces other than French that Monroe might've had, but there's a, um, trying to keep up with what's coming down here um, of the questions. And um, I see that uh, someone's asking, uh, they say they came in late to the presentation and so maybe missed the answer, but uh, if you can comment again a little bit on the degree to which if you don't have detailed receipts, um, how you might approach judging uh, when a, a piece should be brought, what period a piece should be brought back to. Of course, you were able to detail not only the paper record, in some respects, um, even when the piece itself isn't there, and then also the 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 evidence that the object itself can provide, and sort of uh, you know the detective work that proceeds from that. But um, whether it's with this furniture suite or or other pieces, um, uh, how how do you go about trying to to sort of dial in where you're going to restore something to what time frame? Yeah, it's not. Um... It's not always an easy question here um, because uh, pieces have been used for for so many decades and through different administrations and have seen a lot of redecorations. Um, I mean, with the with the older pieces, I think we definitely um, you know tend to gravitate towards the earliest or original um, upholstery treatments, for example, that they had. Um, we don't always defer to that, um, but I would say for the most part that is usually where we look, at least. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of where we may have restored something to a period that wasn't the original. Um, It's certainly been done, such as when Jacqueline Kennedy chose to um, have the eagle-supported side tables in the state dining room painted white and gold rather than their original mahogany. Um, but, for example, we eventually restored those back to their original mahogany. So, um, I, you know, we definitely have a, a strong tendency to, to look towards what we know about their original um, appearance. Although, as you note, the Balanche Suite uh, was in red and crimson originally, right. but, but because of the blue room becoming the blue room, um, uh, and, and it's still a period fabric, just a, a little bit later period fabric. Um, uh, when the blue comes in, right? It is, and right, we didn't, you know, that is absolutely true, that we didn't restore it to its original red. Um, we did look for, you know, in 1817 fabric versus in 1837. We we didn't know anything, we didn't know anything about the upholstery chosen in 1837, the first blue, for example. So we actually knew more about the original red um, with the description of the laurel leaves, but before, you know, photography um, and in the absence of any known written descriptions of what that upholstery looked like in 1837 when Van Buren changed it to blue, we we did stick with uh, the original Monroe information. There was a part of that question that, that I, I didn't read that. I just realized now here. Do the choices made in terms of how to approach the, the restorations or the presentation of pieces um, vary by president. Do the presidents, uh, do the first families have um, a particular uh, say in some of the uh, the choices that you end up making in the conservation or the uh, refinishing or re- refurbishing process? Um, they do. Um, they often 
I mean, I will say that many of the projects that we take on are often dictated by need, what has worn out, what needs to be um, redone. If a um, president or first lady had a particular interest in doing a space, um, I mean, we would certainly, we, we always try to certainly to please the president and first lady that are in office. Um, we do, though, for the public spaces, we work with an advisory committee, the Committee for the Preservation of the White House, um, which helps um, protect the museum character of the rooms, the public rooms, as we say. Um, in terms of the private quarters, the, the presidents and first ladies can do whatever they they like with with their private spaces. Um, we just have that uh, kind of... Uh, intermediary of the committee advising on the on the public spaces and so again if 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 someone raises a desired project we will certainly do our best to to undertake it but we also do have the buffer of like i said the committee formed of museum professionals to um potentially if i don't know something completely crazy was suggested like i don't know let's paint every room black I don't know, <laughs> something like that, you know, um, something uh, if, that, if President again, Jagger comes along. Yes, that might happen. <laughs> right. Exactly. We, we do have some protections in place for what's considered um, uh, the museum. And, and we uh, we are um, uh, by by uh, by act of Congress, we are um, a museum collection. And like I said, and, and the committee was formed also under um, the, the federal jurisdiction to in order to protect it. So there are some actual legal protections in place, too. Now, speaking of the influence of first families, uh, this is going back to another question. Um, uh, you've noted, um, and, and it, it has been noted by uh, other uh, uh, historians, as well as uh, people uh, in, in collections work, that uh, there's no real evidence, no written evidence uh, of Elizabeth Monroe's involvement with the choices of the French furniture or the other furnishing choices, um, but that there's some, you know, feeling that there was likely a degree of collaboration with her husband. Um, so is, is there any evidence at all um, uh, I'm assuming the answer is no, uh, of, of any specific decision um, and it could be even anecdotal versus documentary uh, that, that might bear on her opinion or involvement uh, with the refurnishing. If there is, I'm not aware of it. Um, I yeah. dearly wish um, there was or that, you know, that that had been uncovered. Um, certainly, if anybody knows, let me know. <laughs> yeah, the James um, Nomi's would like to know, too. Yes, we, yeah. <laughs> we never found it either. So much of the Monroe's correspondence uh, uh, between them and, and and even with others was burned uh, at, at Mrs. Monroe's death um, by uh, President Monroe, something that, that was not uncommon in that time. Um, I think that we have always assumed, and perhaps you all do too, that because there was such a close, really working partnership between the Monroes in, in not only the management of their personal affairs, but of uh, their public affairs, whether it's during his ambassadorial posts or um, later on, uh, certainly as president, that we have to assume that there would be some interaction there on, on those choices. But um, the president, though, in, in this, as well as in continuing the, the construction work at the White House, was very hands-on. Um, and uh, so we certainly see evidence of that. Um, what uh, we we're asked here was the hardest part of the rest of restoration process um, for you uh, to a tackle, and why do you keep using horsehair um, for the chairs? <laughs> um, we continue to use horsehair because that was the traditional material that was used. Um, we, you know, we try other than the um, the plywood boards that I mentioned. Um, we try to use all the same traditional materials, which honestly are hard to get. Um, you know, it's not easy to find hundreds and hundreds of or, um, vendors that can provide hundreds and hundreds of pounds of horsehair. Um, but um, we're trying to create the original feel and look of um, what those pieces um, were like. And so, like I said, we use um, linen webbing um, and, you know, natural fibers. And of course, the, uh, the horsehair was the traditional stuffing. And we use it because it lasts. 
um, you know, something that's done in the traditional manner for the under upholstery can last 50 years versus, um, you know, modern upholstery. Um, a lot of the foams and that can disintegrate within 20, 25 years sometimes. Mm -hmm. So the durability and, um, you know, the authenticity factors are, are both reasons that we chose to do it that way. The question actually, too, as I look at it, says, why did you keep the horsehair after restoring the chair? So I guess I want to clarify, too, was any of the horsehair in the, the, the chairs retained or was it swapped out for all new? Um, none, of, none of it was retained. Um, the only piece that we have that we own uh, for, that has the original under upholstery is the newest armchair, which we just acquired. Um, and in that case, we did remove the back section with the original material, and we will not reinstall that um, in the chair. We will use new materials when it, uh, when it undergoes upholstery. So we, we did not use any old material. So that, I guess, becomes a documentary reference within the collection for, for that. Correct. Right? Exactly. Yeah. The other part of that question was, what was the, the hardest part of the process? Um, as y'all went through uh, all the different steps of this, or, or did any stand out as being more challenging than uh, uh, others? Um, I mean, I think the most maybe important step for us was um, finding or being able to establish a partnership with um, with Xavier Bonet, who is a trained upholsterer. Um, and but also an art historian and having the knowledge to be able to help us interpret that 1817 document, um, not only it being in French, but of course also um, referring to, you know, um, certain certain things that we don't use anymore, you know, but he was able to to help us um interpret and understand that receipt in a way that we would we wouldn't have been able to um without his help and so um you know like i said finding finding the right person to to help us on this project um because you know it was definitely a project that um uh we wanted to do right we wanted to get right and um you know we just we knew that um, we didn't necessarily have the expertise to do it alone. And so um, uh, once, you know, once we identified Xavier to be able to help us, um, things really fell into place. I mean, he helped us find the actual upholstery pattern that we selected. Um, the gilding we had, you know, under, I guess, greater control. But he also, um, you know, was able to put us in touch with uh, with French gilders that we discussed and had many long discussions about original appearance and, and that. So um, uh, at least for me, that was the, that was the biggest challenge and, you know, most successful find for us was, was him. Um, our ever alert and helpful um, archivist at the James Monroe Museum and associate editor of the papers of James Monroe, Heidi Stello has noted that uh, James Monroe did mention in one correspondence that Mrs. Monroe would be responsible for decisions uh, and logistics on the curtains and the hangings in the Blue Room. Um, so ah. a, a, a very, very slight mention that has survived. Um, uh, so she's on the implementation side. He's on the acquisition awesome. side. She's handling in implementation. So there, we've, we've updated fantastic. the record. I would, I would love to, uh, to, to get that citation. I'm, I'm sure it will be on its way to you very shortly. <laughs> um, um, I also, uh, I did I mention this before, I just wanted to refer back to this, that uh, as you noted, the vast majority of what Monroe acquired in this order uh, was from France, um, and that would cause some comment later. But my understanding, there were some English and American pieces, um, domestically manufactured pieces acquired by him in the same time, uh, at the same time. And I don't know whether uh, there are known examples of any of these that survive either in the White House collection or elsewhere. Do you do you have any information on some of the non-French things that he got? Um, well, the most significant survival are the chairs that he ordered from local Georgetown cabinet maker William King Jr. for the East Room. Um, and those are kind of a funny story in terms of they were ordered by Monroe and then they weren't upholstered under him because he wasn't able to complete the um, furnishing of the East Room under his um, uh, 
tenure. And so those chairs sat unupholstered um, for 11 years, actually, until they were upholstered finally by Andrew Jackson in 1829. Um, we think that those chairs may have even been, you know, they certainly aren't copies of the Bell and Jay suite by any means, but they certainly are French inspired, I would say. And, um, you know, uh, so he, even in his domestic purchases, he, again, was looking for um, certainly a, a French-inspired um, look. Um, we don't know nearly as much about, I can't think of any English um, items that have survived that we know of. Um, and certainly, like I said, the, the French furnishings were really only focused on two rooms, um, mm -hmm. the state dining room and the blue room. And um, so there, there were some French things that went into the red and the green rooms, as I discussed. But um, the majority of the furnishings in those rooms were not French, but they were of um, uh, presumably primarily domestic manufacture. But unfortunately, um, most of them do not survive. Well, we have gone through, uh, looks like all the questions that have come in and, and the couple I had in reserve. Um, I've, I've got other things I'd love to talk about, but we can't keep going on all night. Um, really appreciate, uh, Melissa, you being with us tonight for uh, our, our lecture, continuing a tradition of White House curatorial staff um, taking part in the James Monroe lecture. Now, you, as we've said, and I've beaten it to, to death here, you've been live <laughs> in the White House. You're in your curatorial <laughs> offices, right? Um, I am ground there. floor of, yep, where our office is located on the ground floor of the main mansion mm -hmm. um, block. So, um, yes, I'm I'm in the White House right now. <laughs> and, and you and a lot of the rest of the staff are going to be getting ready to um, get things set for the forthcoming wedding. Uh, there that is end. correct. That's what's taking place today and tomorrow is all preparation for that. Well, we'd be remiss if we didn't note, uh, as many folks watching probably know, that the first White House wedding of a of a presidential child mm -hmm. was Mariah Monroe uh, in 1820. So it's a nice little uh, uh, yeah. symbolism here that we're we're doing this in the eve of the preparation of the next White House wedding. So we're very happy that uh, that that could happen. Um, again, uh, Melissa, thank you so much uh, for uh, being a part of our. Uh, continuing uh, tradition of the Monroe Lecture, and we look forward to talking with you again. Lindsay, thank you.